we're starting a brand new way of teaching at the feast. We're starting something exciting. God is birthing a whole new generation of people who will hunger to follow the word. By book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, story by story. We're gonna sit at the master's feet with total humility and allow the text as divinely inspired to speak to our hearts. Get ready because we're gonna start this journey of longing and really understanding God and His Word for you. Happy Sunday, everybody, and welcome again to Feast at Home. This is your builder, brother, Audi Villaraza, and I want to welcome all of you watching from all the different corners of the world. We want to be blessed to know where we're streaming at, and we want to thank God for the gift of technology that enables us to visit the homes of so many people. Thank you for welcoming me and brother Bo into your lovely homes, all right? I hope and pray that God uses this message to bless you and inspire you and change you, okay? Let me introduce the talk that we're going to give today. I'm just so excited to give this to you. We are on talk 14 of best preaching ever. And the talk title for today is absolutely self-explanatory. In fact, if you need to leave right after I announce it, you're going to know what we're going to talk about. Okay, so here it is. Get ready. Stop overthinking. All right. Um, I don't know who this message is for, but I'm praying that you will receive this with a lot of love and humility in your heart. Okay, so get ready to be blessed today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Can I invite you to stretch your hands out and then say this with me? Today, I receive all of God's love for me. Today, I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today, I open myself to God's blessings, healing and miracles. Today I open myself to God's word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved, I am God's servant, and I am God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody, can I invite you to lift your hands as we sing? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This topic today, I tell you, it's so relevant. It will speak to any person I can imagine. Doesn't matter what age you have, what background you, you came from or what co course you took in college because you see, I believe that we all speak a universal language. Again, it doesn't matter what blood courses through your veins or what country you live in. We all speak this common language and the language is called worry. Come on, how many people here have worries right now? Why don't you say amen? Amen. I've got some worries. I've got some troubles. I've got some things that's burdening me. I've got some things that I'm carrying on top of my shoulders. I've got some worries. See, you've got worries. I've got worries. We all have worries, especially now at a time when we're living during uncertain moments, right? There's so many risks right now. Businesses are at risk. Careers are, are at risk. Your health is at risk. He relationships are at risk. Even education is at risk. And so I believe that worry is the universal language of this new normal. But you see, it's a good day if you have worries in your heart to be joining us because we are on Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus actually talks about this topic called worry. Okay, so turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. 
Let's all read from verse 25. Jesus says, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? I mean, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't they, or aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Verse 27, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? We're going to talk about this later. And then it says, verse 28, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God could care so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly look after you. Why do you have so little faith? Verse 31, so don't worry about these things. Jesus wants to say someone. He says, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. I hope that there are no unbelievers right now, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. And he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. And then Jesus finishes, finishes it by saying, so don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. It's a long verse, my dear friends, but I'm telling you, I guarantee you, it's going to be worth it to listen to this message today. See, one of the things that I believe just listening to that message that really tells us is that, you know, worry is a normal thing. It's a normal thing because Jesus would not say, you know, I know you've got worries. And so he says, don't worry. Don't worry about what you will eat or what you will wear. Jesus knows that worry is a normal thing. It was a normal thing back then. It's still a normal thing right now. So please stop giving yourself a hard time if you've got worries. It doesn't mean that you have lesser faith. It doesn't mean that God loves you less. It only means that you are a human being. See, every human being experiences worries. In fact, look at this. The Son of Man, who was part God and he, and he became part man, he also had worries. Let me read to you some of Jesus' worries in the book of Mark. It says, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. That's what he, Jesus says. And then in the book of Luke, he even says, he prayed more fervently and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. You see, even Jesus experienced worry. So t take a look at this. The question is not actually, do you get worried? But the question is, the more, que the more important question is, do you let your worries rule over you? All right, and I hope that this message is going to bless you today. Can I can I invite you to pray in the next few moments, all right? Everybody bow down your head, close your eyes, and just picture yourself in the presence of God right now. Father in heaven, we believe that you know what's inside our hearts and what's inside our minds, and you can see us. You can see us for who we are and everything that we're thinking, everything that we're feeling. And you see, Lord, all the worries, all the concerns that's piled up over our heads. And we ask you, Lord, to speak to us in the next few moments so that you can encourage us how to focus more on our faith and not on our fear, Lord. Thank you so much. We are ready. We are completely wide open for how you are going to deliver this message, Lord. So speak to us in a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody, one more time, sing with me. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I am just so excited for the waste that God is going to use this piece of passage to speak over your life, all right? Hi, everybody. I am so happy that you welcome us into your home and welcoming us into your heart. It is with joy I'm able to share with you the Word of God. And my prayer, as always, every time we connect in this way, the Word of God will be so powerful. It will not only change your life, it will bless every part and area of your life life and of your family. So we're praying for that right now in Jesus' name. I'm so excited for the word. Are you ready? Here it is. God is telling you today. Here's the one big message. You have to include God in the picture. 
If there's somebody beside you, tap that person on the shoulder. Tell that person, include God in the picture. Yes, because Jesus is talking about in our key passage about not worrying. Do not worry. And he gives five reasons why we should not worry. Are you ready? Here's reason number one. Very important. Life is more than what you see. <laughs> Life is more than what you see. Here's verse 25. This is where, where Jesus begins. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. And then Jesus asks this, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Isn't life more than what you see and what you smell and what you hear? You know what? There's this condition called myopia. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, <laughs> but it's nearsightedness. Nearsightedness, meaning to say the objects that are nearby, it's clear to you, clear to your eyes. But as you move the object farther and farther away from you, it gets bl it's get blurrier and blurrier. Now, I want you to know if you, if you, it's very obvious if somebody has nearsightedness, you know how they read their phone like this very near, two inches away from the, from the phone. That's how they read their text message. I have a friend who has that condition and, and we, we joke around with him because we tell him that the font size of his text messages are like a billboard. Yeah, it's gigantic. It's like PowerPoint presentation. And, and we would be laughing about him and, 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 and we would laugh together about it. But what I'm going to share with you now and think about it, think about this, worry, is like spiritual nearsightedness. It is because all we see are the things that are nearby, our problems, our debts, our bills, our sickness, our relationship problem, our struggles with our kid and with our parent and with our in-laws and sickness, etc. All we see are the objects and the problems that are nearby. We do not see the God who just a few meters away behind your problem, God is at work. We don't see that. That's why worry is like spiritual nearsightedness, that if we only draw the curtain of the physical dimension, do you know who you see? You see God rearranging your circumstances for your good, for the purpose of blessing you. Now, I want you to understand this, that God, He's saying, do not worry because it is giving you nearsightedness. You, if you want, here's, here's the thing. If, if you want to be healed and to remove worry from your life, you've got to include God in the picture. Are you ready for reason number two? Here's reason number two. I love this. You're more valuable than you think you are. I'm going to say that again. You're more valuable than you think you are. And in verse 26, it says, Jesus says, he continues, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in the barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? I'm going to, I'm going to read that last verse. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Now, do you know what this shows? That Jesus, he was steeped in the Hebrew scriptures. He was steeped in the book of Psalms. Perhaps as a young boy, he would pray and read the book of Psalms again and again. And so when he looked at nature, what did he see? The amazing truth of the extreme generosity of God. I want you to understand this. Worry, it's normal. It happens to all of us. But when you allow worry to rule your mind, you know what's happening? You're forgetting the extreme generosity of God. And what you need to do is go to nature, to look at nature, to look at the birds and, and, and to look at the flowers, you know, and, and to go deeper and see that there is this God who is generous and abundant and loving. Now, I want you to understand that I'm going to say something that I've said before. It's a cliche, but you know the reason why it's a cliche? Because it's true. Are you ready? 
I believe that the solution to worry is to worship. It's to actually include God in the picture. Worriers are focused on the things that are around them. Worshippers are focused on the things that are above them. That there is this generous God who is sitting on the throne. And yes, he is still in charge of the messy situation that you are in. I want you to know that a worrier takes on a specific perspective and a worshiper takes on another kind of perspective. The worrier takes on a worm's perspective. Yeah, from the ground down, looking up, everything is gigantic. A pebble is a boulder. And a raindrop is like an ocean. And a blade of grass is like a giant tree. And a tiny poop from a worm looks like a mountain of poop. And that's what worry does. A tiny problem becomes like catastrophic. But the worshiper takes on the eagle's perspective because the worshiper is in the throne room of God. And from the throne room of God, from that viewpoint, what happens? Everything is small. A boulder is like a pebble. And yes, an ocean is just like a rain, raindrop. <laughs> and it's true. You know, you've got a gigantic tree. Oh, it's a blade of grass. From the perspective of the throne room of God, what am I saying? I'm saying that from a worshiper's viewpoint, there are no big problems. Every problem is small. Can I share something to you that happened to me last year? I shared this already last year, but I want to share it again. That one morning I woke up with a heavy heart. And it was about a problem that I really felt I had no control over. By the way, that is, that is the thing. That is the thing. The reason why we get worried is because there are no handles. And then, I, 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 you know, when, when there's a handle to a situation, I kind of like feel more at peace and calm. But there was this one problem I was trying to deal with and there was no handle and I didn't know what to do. And I was at a loss. And so I woke up with worry in my heart. Yes, I was overthinking. Believe me, <laughs> guilty. I, I was overthinking and I was, oh gosh, what am I going to do? So, but I had to, you know, the day had to go on. I stuff I had to do. In fact, I had to go to the province. I had to ride a plane, go to the province, give a talk. And, and so I, I had to do that. You know, I dragged myself, you know, to, to through the motions of dressing up, riding the car, you know. I, I, I was doing all this with a heavy heart. I rode the plane with a heavy heart. I was preparing for my talk on the plane, but still so much bothered by my worries and, and by overthinking. And then the hosts uh, picked me up in the airport. I rode the car. And then all of a sudden, lo and behold, I looked to the left as the car was moving. Um, I saw the shoreline. Yes, I saw the beach. And I, I told my host, how many minutes do I have left before the talk? Is, do, do, do we have, you know, 30 minutes to spare? And he said, sure. So I said, can we stop? Can we stop by? Because I love the beach and I love the shoreline. And, and so they said, sure. So we stopped. I walked to the very edge of the water right there. And I looked up and it was hot, but I didn't care. I looked up. Um, closed my eyes and like, like what I usually do, I lifted up both hands up in the air and I did my prayer of surrender. Now, this is something that we're going to teach you at the end of this talk. We're actually going to do it with you. Okay. But what, what I did was, and by the way, just want you to know that so many people they, they ask me that question because I, I preach this a lot, you know, in full tank every day. I tell them, surrender, surrender your problems to God, surrender your worries to God. Do you know that so many people write to me and they ask me, Brother Bo, how? How should, how does one surrender to God? And, and the temptation is surrender, <laughs> You know, but then I realized something that this is something that I've been doing all my life for the past 40 years of my spiritual journey with God. I would keep on surrendering and surrendering. And then I realized 
Some people need some guidance. So what we're going to do at the end of this talk, we're going to have, we're going to teach you four step prayer of surrender. But that, that's what I did on that beach. I, w I just closed my eyes, looked up, and then I just lifted my hands and I, and I inhaled God's love. I just inhaled the love of God and I let the love of God fill up my lungs. And then what I did was I exhaled. And when I exhaled, I exhaled my worries. I exhaled my fears. I, I exhaled my, my, th this fear, this agitation in my soul because I, I felt that I had no control. And I just exhaled all of that. Then I inhaled again God's love. I just was doing that again and again and again. And I, I really, really felt that the burden on my shoulder just got lifted up because I truly surrendered it to God. And I truly said, Lord God, I'm including you in the picture. I'm including you in the picture, in, 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 my, in my frame. You're there. You're working behind the scenes. You're already there rearranging the circumstances for the purpose of blessing me. And I, I trust you. You know, I, I felt so good. And I, I went back to the car and I said, let's go to my talk. <laughs> Uh, and um, I, I want to share that with you, that this, this talk is very powerful. It sounds simple and probably you've heard these things before, but I'm telling you, this is what you need to hear. And this is what a lot of people need to hear. We have three more reasons to cover on why you should not worry. Here's the third reason. Let me give it to you now. The third reason of why you should not overthink. Go ahead and write this down. Because worry doesn't add anything to your life. Okay, worry won't add anything to your life. Jesus says in verse 27, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? You know, worry will not add a single moment to your life. It won't add a day to your life because on the contrary, worry actually takes a day. It steals a moment in your life. Think about all those things that you were worried about in the past and moving forward, knowing what you know now. Didn't you survive all those things, right? Everything has a way of working itself out in the end. Think about this. Worry will not add into your life. Instead, it subtracts a lot in your life. What does it subtract? Let, let me give you three things. The first thing is that for one, worry subtracts peace. Worry steals the peace in your life. You know, when worry comes, peace exits the building right? You, you get all confused. You become so afraid. You panic. So peace leaves, your, leaves out the door. Okay, that's what worry does. The second thing that worry subtracts is that worry steals your health. Uh-huh. Worry cr uh, creates a lot of health problems in your life. Like for example, it creates hypertension. It creates a lot of stress. It creates a lot of anxiety. It creates muscle pains. It creates depression. And guess what? Worry also creates wrinkles on your forehead. The third thing that worry subtracts is time. All right, worry steals the time in your life. Think about this. What are the things, what were the things that you were worried about 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Think about all those things. Like for example, do you remember that time when you were still in high school, when you were worried about that chemistry exam that you thought you were gonna fail? Fast forward all the way up till now, did the boss that hired you for the company that you're working for now, did he have, have to ask you what the atomic number of zinc and nickel was? No, he didn't, right? Think about this. Another example. You were so worried about that math class that you, that algebra class that you thought you weren't going to pass when you were in college. But then think about this. Fast forward all the way to the business that you started. Did the business that you started require you to know what X plus Y equals Z mean? <laughs> of course not, right? But here's the thing. I'm not belittling any of these subjects. I'm not saying that these subjects were wrong. In fact, these subjects have a purpose in life. But what I'm saying is that Jesus says, worry is useless. Worry wastes your time because you lose a lot of, uh, of nights 
sleepless nights, you know, tur tossing and turning over those things. Worry is useless, my dear friends, because it steals the joy, it steals the peace, it steals your health, and it steals your time, okay? So stop overthinking, okay? That's the first thing. The, here's the fourth reason of why you should not overthink, and it's because God cares for you. Uh-huh. Let me read to you what Jesus says when he used the analogy of the, of the flowers, of the lilies of the field. Remember a few verses before, Jesus said, look at the birds. But now Jesus says in verse 28, look at the lilies of the field. He says, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly look after you. Why do you have so little faith? You know what I find so funny and ironic about this piece of passage is that this is such an old text. You know, this was written years and years ago, 2,000 years ago to be exact, when Jesus lived. You know, this was written by Matthew. But what Jesus said 2,000 years ago about the things that they were worried about back then, think about this. We are still worried about the same things today. What we eat, look at the birds. God provides for them. God feeds them. And what we wear, look at the flowers and how God clothes them. We are worried about the same things that they were worried back then. This is what makes Jesus a genius. But here's the thing, okay? I'm going to explain this verse uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few moments. But let me just say this, that we're worried about the same things that people were worried back then, what to eat and what to wear. But let me qualify this, okay? It's not so much about, you know, what you're going to eat for lunch today or what kind of cuisine you're going to enjoy for, for dinner tonight. It's not even so much about what kind of clothes you're going to be wearing because chances are right now all you're wearing are house clothes. Am I correct? But what it means, it's what it represents is that what we eat represents survival. How are we going to survive today in the context of what life is now and what you eat represents or rather what you wear represents your status. What's your status in life now? And so what Jesus is saying is that we're always going to be worried about our survival and our status. And what Jesus is actually encouraging with us today is that God says he is concerned about you. So stop overthinking because there is a God who cares for all that you need. In the fifth reason, this is the final reason of why you should not overthink. God will give you everything that you need. And so Jesus says this in verse 33. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Take note, okay? Jesus uses the word need. He says, God will give you what you need. But notice how Jesus doesn't say what you want. Because Jesus knows that there is a huge difference between what you need and what you want. And what you need may not always be what you want. But I am grateful that we have a God who knows exactly what we need. He may not give you what you want, but He will always give you what you need. Because if you always get what you want, that might not strengthen your faith. It might not deepen your faith. And God might spoil you if you always get what you want. That's why be grateful that God will always give you what you need. Can I get a loud amen, somebody? That's right. But you know what? There is a condition. There is a condition because Jesus says God will give us everything that we need. But before he gives you what you need, you got to do something first. You got to seek the kingdom above all else. That's right. You got to, in other words, put God first. You got to put the kingdom first. So here's the truth. In the context of your worry, worry should always come second and God should always come first. Uh-huh. God always comes first. But you know, I get it. I get it. Because in how we live our life, especially during these uncertain times, here's the truth. Worry doesn't come second. Worry always goes first, right? The first thing that happens when something bad or something difficult or there's a challenge that falls upon us, the first thing that we do is we panic, we worry. Am I right? But let me explain this, okay? Here's what you need to do. 
I said that I'm going to explain those two verses when Jesus said, look at the birds and look at the flowers. I kept on reflecting on these two verses the entire week and, and until it hit me. And I'm praying that you, it will hit you the same way it hit me this week, okay? Let's study the birds. What do the birds know that we don't? For one, the birds see everything from a different perspective, right? Why? Because the birds live in a higher altitude. So they see things from a different vantage point because they live from a higher perspective. So maybe that's what you and I need to do. Maybe we need to take things when worry comes. We need to see things not from a worldly perspective, but from a heavenly perspective. To see that there is a God who is up there who sees everything happening in your life and He knows exactly what you need. So we got to do what the birds do. We got to stay above it. Uh huh. That's right. So what about the flowers now, Brother Audie? Well, I thought about this for a moment. What do the flowers know that we don't? Well, for one, the flowers, they're not shifty. The flowers, they don't transfer from place to place. They don't go to where the, the grass is greener. They don't transfer just like that. You know what the flowers do? They stay planted. They stay grounded. So maybe that's what you and I need to do. That in the context of our worry, we're not going to be fleeting. We're not going to be shifty. But we're going to stay planted in God's kingdom. We're going to grow roots in God's garden. So when winds come to blow us, when storms come to threaten us, we're going to stay planted in God's garden right? So here's what you need to do. Do as the plants do and stay planted, okay? So stay above it, but at the same time, stay planted, stay grounded. Is this blessing some of you right now? Okay, I'm going to try to end this point by, by giving you this analogy, okay? I'm going to tell you the story of, uh, how many of you know Voltus 5? Voltus 5, come on. If you know Voltus 5, why don't you click, quickly type in, I'm old school, Come on, come on, I'm old school. People who know Voltus 5 are of a certain age, and I'm of that age, okay? And then the generation that came before me. See, Voltus 5 was a Japanese anime cartoon. If you don't know, if you're a millennial, you don't know what it is, go Google it after this session, okay? But anyway, I, I loved watching Voltus 5 when I was growing up. Saturday morning cartoons was such a favorite for me because it would show Voltus 5 during Saturdays, okay? But anyway, you reach a certain point in your life, you watch Voltus 5 long enough, you will notice that Voltus 5, the ending is always very predictable, right? The ending is always predictable. What would happen is that at the start of every battle, the five ships would go out of their bases and fight the big enemy. Whether it's a giant cockroach or a giant lobster or a, a giant crab, whatever, or a giant lizard, well, they would always start fighting that big enemy one by one, you know, little ships, five ships. And then when they're about to lose, that's when they shout, let's vault in, right? Dun -dun 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 -dun. You guys remember that, right? So they vault in and they form this one gigantic robot. And that's at the end of every battle. That's when they would do the killer move, all right? The killer move is when they would remove the laser sword from the middle of the chest. And then they would slice the enemy down and up with a signature V form, right? And that's how the story always ends. But here's the thing. It, it kind of makes you wonder, if that's how the ending will always be, why not start or why not do the killer move at the start of every battle? Why not, you know, just pull out the laser sword and then slice that enemy in the V-form? And instead, what they do is at the start of every battle is that they would send out the five ships and the ships, and when they're about to lose, they're going to vault in. And before they even use the killer move, they're going to use the missiles and the guns and the ultramagnetic top. And the only time that when they're really about to lose, that's when they do the killer move. So the question is, why do the killer move at the very end? Why not do it at the start of every battle? And of course, the answer is very obvious because, well, there would be no drama, no suspense, no thriller, no story, and no spots for commercial to be played on, okay? Naturally. But you know what? Why am I sharing this? Because in the context of your worry, here's my question. Whenever you're worried, why not just start every battle, every bad situation with your killer move? 
Did you know that you have a killer move? Some of you might be scratching your heads right now. Brother Audie, what is my killer move? You and me, we all have one universal killer move. And I'll tell you what it is. It's called surrender. Surrender is the killer move. Now, some of you might not get this because you might be looking at it from the perspective of the world because you see in worldly terms, surrender means to give up. But in godly terms, surrender means to give your life to God. Your killer move is when you surrender your life to God. So here's the truth. When it comes to your worry, you start with surrender. Start with surrendering your life to God, all right? How do you surrender? Some people might not know how to surrender, especially if you're a first-timer. Here's how you do it. Let me give you the four-step prayer of surrender. The first, uh, the first way to surrender is to have the posture of surrender. What is the posture of surrender? It's always that of humility. That's what we do when we worship, right? We lift our hands. We open our palms. We submit ourselves to know that there is a God up above and He's looking down below us. And so you calm your heart. You calm your yourself and then you prepare to receive God's presence and then the second step is you inhale God's love you breathe in his presence let it soak you let it let it come in like the oxygen that you need every single day and then the third step is when you exhale all the worries exhale all the pain all the difficulties all the anxiety and while you're doing that here's step number four step four is while you exhale you say the words I surrender So you say it out loud, Lord, I surrender my worries. I surrender my strife. I surrender my panic. I surrender my family. I surrender my finances. I surrender my children, Lord. I surrender my life to you. And while you do that, you imagine while you are surrendering that you are transferring all the burdens from your shoulders onto God's loving, big, mighty hands. You see, my dear friends, that's what we do every single week. Whenever we come in to worship God, whenever you lift your hands. That's your act of surrender. You see, worry is when you focus on the situation, but worship is when you focus on the source, and God is the source of everything that you need. So whenever you put Him first, whenever you prioritize Him, the Bible says that when you seek the kingdom above all else, everything that you need, protection, provision, peace, it will be added unto you. That's your killer move. So when you get worried this week, don't start with worry, but start with surrender. You see, when you start with worry, you end with worry. When you start with fear, you end with fear. When you start with panic, you end with panic. But when you start with God, guess what? You end with God. So end with God in mind. Start with God, end with God. Surrender your life to Jesus. Are you ready to worship Him right now? All right, let's all come in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God in heaven, here we are presenting ourselves as uh, as we are to you, Lord. Damaged, weak, and broken. But here we are, Lord, looking for your grace. Thank you so much. We receive your presence right now as we surrender all that we are, all our worries, all our brokenness, all our difficulties, all our fears, Lord, into your big and mighty hands. We respond to your goodness right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button and tell people and all your friends and family about the inspiration they can receive here. And remember to subscribe and click the bell icon so that you get notified when we're going to upload the next inspiring video.